From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, today's episode is about power. It's often said power corrupts, and, you know, we've all seen that happen one way or another. You might remember a kid who got a little despotic when they became hall monitor or kept an eye on the class while the teacher was gone. There are no shortages of stories of local politicians who dip their finger into the, uh, the sugar jar of public coffers. But what happens when the people at the very top reaches of law enforcement start breaking the same laws, these specific same laws they are meant to enforce? That's our story today, the still unfolding tale of Charles McGonigal, Charlie, to his friends. For 22 years, he served the FBI and... According to authorities, he began serving other masters somewhere along the way. Here are the facts. Yes, we first learned about old Charlie here when we did a quick piece of strange news on him because I think it was it's it's something's been going on for a long time, but it made the news because he was formally being charged with some stuff. Uh, Not good stuff. No, he wasn't charged with being like the dopest guy at the roller skating rink. Not this time. That was years ago. (laughs) That was in his past. It's true. Um, So what was interesting about this case specifically? Charlie Charles McGonigal. Uh, Not a whole lot of information out there in the public sphere, but we do. We can ascertain some basics. He was born. In the late 60s, 1968, based on what we found, um, in Ohio. And he went to Johns Hopkins, a prestigious university, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in business administration in 1990. It's funny. I always think of Johns Hopkins for their medical school, but they also have, you know, other disciplines represented there. And business is one of them. Uh, He got that uh, in 1990. Then in November of 1994, he got married to Pamela Fox McGonigal. Cool middle name. Yeah, total fox. Uh, Yeah, I I like that, right? That's a cool name. Uh, But right now, as we record, this guy is not in jail. He's not in prison. As we record on March 3rd, 2023, he is living in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Uh, He joined the FBI in 96, and he also continued to pursue his education. In 2012, he got a master's degree also from Johns Hopkins, as you mentioned, Noel, And this might seem weird to people, but it's not super unusual. In a ton of careers, folks will commit themselves to a brutal schedule to pursue higher education because it it furthers your job prospects, right? And in some reaches of government, there's actually a tiered system of base pay that rises uh, depending on your level of education. So, you know, your schedule sucks for a while, but it is a good investment in your time, especially if you're ambitious. And as we'll come to find, Charlie is nothing if not ambitious. May I quickly derail us and ask a silly question, chicken or the egg question. What came first, Chevy Chase, the actor, or Chevy Chase, Maryland? Chevy Chase, Maryland. I, 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 do, I do the answer. <laughs> okay. Do you think it was Chevy Chase named after the, the city? Or is it just a coincidence? It's, is, is it a stage name? Is Chevy's name actually Chevy? Or was that just a nickname as, as a result of this place? And did he have any association with it? His real name is Cornelius Crane Chase. Okay, one would imagine then it was a, it was a tip of the hat to old Chevy Chase, Maryland. Sorry. It's funny. I, I only first found out about Chevy Chase, Maryland from Fallout 2. Um, the one that takes place in the D.C. area, and I thought it was made up. <laughs> I thought it was some kind of jokey reference to Chevy Chase the actor, but not the case if any of you fellow conspiracy realists uh, were wondering the same thing. Yeah, it's a real place, and uh, as as our pal Paul just said, I, I don't know if you'll put that in the air, Paul, but Paul pointed out uh, that Chevy Chase, Maryland, is a pretty prestigious and wealthy 
area of Maryland. So this guy is living in a good neighborhood as we speak. Uh, He, in his career, over 22 years, he went on to serve in various parts of the FBI. He was always moving up. New York, Cleveland, D.C., Baltimore. In 2016, there was quite a coup toward the end of his career. He was named the special agent in charge of the counterintelligence division for the New York field office. Yes, again, we know only an outfit like the U.S. government would make a word like counterintelligence and take it seriously without realizing that if you if you don't know what they do, it sounds like they're the dumb squad. They're very much not. <laughs> they're very much not. They're not dumb people. Well, let, let's talk about what counterintelligence means for the FBI. So we've talked a lot in the past about how the CIA is the intelligence part of the United States that operates outside of the U.S., So they're the ones that actually put out feelers and will go into another country, conduct intelligence in that country, uh, you know, whether that is intelligence or counterintelligence in that country. The FBI handles all the stuff that happens inside the territory. So FBI counterintelligence is basically keeping a lookout for any other spies that may come into the U.S., either uh, with diplomatic cover. That's often what happens, especially in New York because of the U.N., and they just Try and see, oh, is that diplomat actually a diplomat or is that some KGB agent or something like that? But like the etymology of the term intelligence even is a little veiled, right? Because, I mean, intelligence, you know, in the way we know it, Webster's wise means, you know, smarts, means the ability to ascertain information and some level of deductive reasoning power. But in this case, intelligence refers to gathering information, Right. So it, there's a there's a connection. But counterintelligence is sort of like uh, an oppositional equal and opposite reaction to those gathering intelligence on you. Right. You, you just got to take it literally. They're yeah. countering yeah. the intelligence. Mm-hmm. Right. This is um, I guess the way I would put it for an analogy is the FBI and a counterintelligence capability is largely the goalie of a big, big soccer game. And the field is the rest of the world. So they're trying to keep the balls from getting into the net that is U.S. activity. Uh, but Because the net has all the important stuff in it. Right, but this net also bites back because part of a counterintelligence operation, even though it could, it's largely defensive, part of it is the ability to not just identify foreign actors but potentially turn them toward their own purposes. Everybody does this. It's a glass planet. There are no real, quote unquote, good guys, but there are rules. And that's where Charlie goes wrong. So he works on some high level, high sensitivity stuff, the kind of thing that you don't hear about until it's sewn up, right? Uh, until until the DOJ is to- is pretty much happy and thinks they have a case. So for two years, he's he's a big wheel in the New York field office. He's in charge of counterintelligence in one of the most sensitive intelligence areas in the country. When he retires, he's got a great distinguished career. Like a lot of people with his level of expertise, he goes to the private sector. Again, this is neither illegal nor necessarily unusual. We see this where you make more money, (laughs) right? You make more money. We see as a natural progression of careers. Now, is it a good thing that that revolving door exists? I would say no, Uh, but it is definitely a door that people use often. We should point out that he retired in 2018, just so he only he only spent around two, two years. years as right. that special agent in charge of counterintelligence. Right, right. And that was a culmination of his career. And let's take a second to say, you know, first he was he was very successful. Uh, he ended up involved with a lot of high profile cases, some of which we reported on in this show in the past. Uh, WikiLeaks. Let's see, he busted. Uh, there were some stories that were really big at the time that a lot of people forgot about, like he uh he busted the Clinton administration's national security advisor, Sandy Berger, for stealing classified documents. And then this is very, he did like spy movie stuff. Like he led the search for a Chinese mole inside the CIA. He was, he was doing, he was doing his job. Uh, and he was 
he could be really great to work with if he considered you a peer or a superior. Uh, he knew when to lay on the butter, but he was also kind of a lot of colleagues we found quoted anonymously said he was kind of a jerk if he thought he was you were working for him. Which I, it makes me biased because <laughs> I, I have no respect for people like that. Absolutely if you can't be not. nice to a waiter, then you're not worth my time. Mm-mm. I feel the exact same way. Uh, yeah, and you can really tell a lot about a person's character by how they treat uh, those working under them. Because uh, you know, we we all three of us have have managed people and 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 headed up teams, and I think we all uh, every single step of the way try to be self aware and treat people with respect, and that's also how you get the best work out of people, not even as a flex or as some sort of manipulation. It's just facts. Uh, and typically, if you treat people like crap, they're going to rebel against you, whether outwardly or, you know, under the table kind of. The way he's described reminds me a lot of that uh, fairly new television show called The Recruit that's uh, based around an FBI agent who's really an attorney, but functioning as uh, as an agent. And it reminds me of the way the FBI in general is described, the, the work atmosphere at, at that uh, outfit, basically of that resenting successes of other people, making sure that you're the one who gets the credit uh, if somebody under you, you know, does something. And again, it's just a fictionalized television show, but it just it really reminds me of the way it's depicted in it. Yeah. Yeah, and let's talk about those descriptions. So one former colleague, Lai's colleagues are very careful to be anonymous because of the way making public statements works. One colleague said that McGonagall was, quote, an egotistical narcissist who frequently screamed at subordinates and resented the success of others, another unfortunately common thing in many industries. And what is more, I mean, this is more dangerous, though, because this is the FBI. Uh, they also say that McGonagall seemed to have or could have used his professional influence to further his political ideology, which is something you're not supposed to do in the FBI, in case anyone was wondering. Uh, there's a great article at a place called Spy Talk by Jeff Stein, who points out that McGonagall is suspected of being part of this unofficial clique in the FBI New York office who wanted to prevent Hillary Clinton from winning the 2016 presidential election. And that he was probably part of this group that pressured the FBI director, James Comey to investigate, you know, the Clinton emails just a few days before the election officially kicked off, which was a huge deal, which was the, a huge deal. The, not only the fact of what it was, but also that it was happening at that time. I remember how much that affected my thinking in 2016. Yeah. And, and at the same time, you know, obviously there were other forces out who wanted to influence the election in an undue way, Russia being the primary. Right. And then there's still, there's still questions about WikiLeaks and how they decided to release what they did and when, but anyhow, let's stay with spy talk. Because once some of these sources get the badge of anonymity, they're way more open about it. They say stuff they wouldn't say with their names attached. Kind of like on the internet. Uh, this guy is describing Charlie and says his peers thought highly of him and his managers did. But a lot of people that worked for him couldn't stand him because he was such a dickhead. He just treated people really bad. <laughs> Jeez. This is not us saying it. We've never worked with Charlie McGonigal. Uh, but he was successful. Uh, he went private industry. He goes, he becomes a vice president at a place called Brookfield Properties, which is a big deal real estate company. And just last year in 2022, I think he was hired as the global head of security for a place called Amen Resorts, A-M-A-N. A -M -A -N. Uh, very, very is weird it Amon? company. Amon, I believe. Yeah. Uh, but I may be mispronouncing. Uh, this place is controversial because of some murky links to a Russian, a, a guy who's a big deal in Russia, who is not Putin. <laughs> An oligarch, you may say. You might, some might. <laughs> and, uh, right? uh, but there's always more to this story, right? So somewhere along the way, 
members of the counterintelligence community, which is very, very close knit, they started to question his allegiance. And this story dropped for us in like 2022, but there was, there was something in the wind by 2018. So as far back, as you said, Ben, as 2018, the British uh, were taking some, keeping some tabs on McGonagall and noticed that he was making some very, taking rather, some very suspicious meetings with a Russian national. Uh, a bit of a red flag considering the circumstances, even as far back. I mean, we've always been a little tenuous with the Russians, I suppose, you know, as far back as the Cold War and the Iron Curtain. So there's always a little bit of suspicion that comes into play when there are secret meetings happening with Russian nationals. Um, uh, and in January of 2023, Charles McGonagall was arrested. This is just a couple of years later after the observation of this meeting uh, on charges of money laundering making false statements in mandatory disclosures to the FBI, violating U.S. sanctions on Russia, because those are still ironclad, <laughs> uh, and more. Yeah, yeah. And, and we should we should mention here, we talked, Ben talked about the glass world where everybody's doing this kind of counterintelligence. It just should be noted that the British intelligence was checking out the Russian person whom uh, McGonagall was meeting. And that's how it happened. And we talk a lot about five eyes and things like that, where there's a lot of intelligence sharing, not all the intelligence, mind yeah. you, never, never all of all the of intelligence, it. but quite a bit is shared between a lot of these Western countries. And I'm assuming that's kind of what happened here. There's back channeling to the FBI after they notice oh, that's a little weird. Oh boy. I'm frightfully afraid there may be a fox in the hen house in it. Fri frightfully <laughs> afraid. I uh, love it. So extra. Yeah, the, the FBI believed the British. They claimed there was a traitor in their midst. So what happened? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. And we're back. That was hopefully Amman Resorts. Here's where it gets crazy. As much as this sounds like something out of a movie, it, look, it, it looked to be the case that McGonagall had been turned. He has not been convicted yet. That's very important to say. We'll probably say it a couple times in this episode. But the authorities, pretty much all of them, DOJ, FBI, you name it, they seem pretty convinced this guy was a spy or at the very least corrupt. And had that, that super important intelligence information in his head or had oh, yeah. access to it potentially, you know, by means of a hard drive or a piece of paper and that kind of thing. And he could be sharing that stuff. Right. And let's take a moment to say, okay, something that spy movies get wrong, like works of fiction always get wrong is, um, is this, and it's kind of a disappointing thing. It's not great for movies, but intelligence, especially high level or secret intelligence is often what we would call perishable. It has, it has a short shelf life, you know, like, stuff from the organic aisle of, of the grocery store. So in other words, just a window in which it is useful. And then outside of that, it is, it is basically not. Yeah, correct. And so this, uh, but the, this means that there's another kind of resource people like this can offer. And that is connections. That's influence. Connections are not necessarily perishable. Uh, they can be burned just like a persona. So we don't like, we'll get into it. We'll, we'll get into what, what he was trading back and forth, but it seems to be seems to be a little bit more like connections and intros and influence than it does to be actionable intelligence on the ground stuff. But his professional life definitely made him aware of tradecraft in a way that many many uh, average people would would never you just wouldn't know you wouldn't know what to ask he he ran 150 fbi agents in new york and they were tasked with remember we said the net bites back they were tasked with shadowing foreign operatives the way the british were following this russian contact and then turning those folks if they could into spies for the u.s now this doesn't mean they're getting someone from like the russian embassy and saying hey we know you're not the it guy and now you work for us, it could be something as seemingly innocuous as we know you work at this consulting firm, right? And we think you have a side gig and we want to give you another one. Or it could be, um, we know that you are 
yes, going to an academic conference here or you're, you know, selling Turkish rugs or whatever, but we also know about those other meetings you had at the Dunkin' Donuts. Well, access is the name of the game here, right? I mean, access to individuals, relationships, you know, with folks that you can kind of blend in with and and get information, um, whether it's nefarious in terms of the knowledge of that person, whether it's just you're kind of got your ears open, you know, and you're, you know, working in these circles. Uh, so when they can identify someone that maybe is willing to play ball, who has that kind of access, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. You know, uh, hope you had a great time at the conference. Uh, why don't you, when you, when you get back to Turkey, you know, why don't you just let us know if any of your colleagues are making breakthroughs and things we would find of interest, right? Yes, like of in, interest, wink, wink, nudge, right, nudge. Like, say no you know, more. and they're talking to a, a young nuclear scientist or something. So this means McGonagall knows about this kind of stuff. He's aware of it and he's the top dog. He's got the catbird seat. Most people only think about this kind of world or industry when you watch cool spy movies, you know, the James Bond stuff. Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy, which is great. It holds up. Uh, so this guy, if he ever, if he does get convicted, it's kind of like he's some dude who worked at a bank for years and years and years before deciding to rob it. So he knows how the bank works already, which means, and this is the thing that keeps tripping me up. This means that he should have by all logic and reason, he should have had a better than average likelihood of conspiring successfully and getting away with it. That's what makes 2018 even more confusing. Like we said, the British clocked it first. He meets a Russian in London. Apparently, despite the fact that um, this is the same year he retired from the FBI he did not know this contact was already being surveilled by the Brits. Like you said, Matt, They'll share intelligence, but never all of it. <laughs> and this well, one, and something small, yeah. something small like that. Okay, we, you know this known Russian person we've been watching is in London right now. We're watching that person. They, there's no reason to share that information with you know <laughs> with the United States. The location and activities of an oligarch in your country like, that doesn't make you know that doesn't make a lot of sense. But when one of your former operatives or former, you know, heads of an intelligence agency is meeting with your target, yeah, you're going to you're going to take note. One anonymous source. Again, these guys kind of loosen their ties when they're anonymous. Uh, One anonymous source would later remark, what the was he thinking? Because years of experience, How much is coffee sprayed? Yeah. <laughs> years of experience running counterintelligence ops uh, means that. McGonagall should have known this London encounter would attract notice. London, like New York, is highly surveilled in this world because there are so many centers of finance and, you know, halls of state power there. And look, you know, this guy lives in the United States. He lives in a nice neighborhood, but he lives in a country separated by two huge oceans. You don't just the the idea that you would travel across the Atlantic for a meeting or a series of meetings implies that it was more than just an accidental run in, you know, or a casual acquaintance. Like, oh, Oleg, fancy seeing you here. I'm only <laughs> saying that. I'm only saying that because I I have a, a pretty good Russian friend who whose name is Oleg. So oh wow. I, so that's a shout out to you, but uh oh, oh God. no no no, he's not an oligarch. Okay, he's not an Oleg arc. Uh, so he does live in London, though. Now that I think about it, I sure. should text him. Yeah, don't meet in a park or something. Uh, <laughs> right. th- look, <laughs> um, do you think he used his cell phone to arrange that? Probably not his personal cell phone, like right? A burner or some kind burners. of encrypted guy. Yeah, yeah, that's burners. what I was alluding to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you don't. You don't just make a phone call to your buddy who happens to be an oligarch and go meet him if you're former head of FBI counterintelligence. We don't know who the Russian contact was yet, but it probably, I'm guessing it probably would have been an agent of an oligarch Mm -hmm. for an interest, you know? The one we're going to talk about here in a minute. (laughs) Yeah, handler or fixer for for a bigger cat. Uh, But this means, like, these sources are saying, okay, this meeting just doesn't just happen. So 
in our mind, based on the knowledge we have as the FBI, this means that we probably stumbled upon an extended relationship, that this was not their first contact. And McGonagall, by that logic, had probably been in contact before he retired from the FBI. Uh, we don't know the exact month he retired in 2018, uh, but we do know this meeting in London happened in 2018. So it may have even been a case where, you know, he gets out and he says, ho, ho, buddy, don't worry. I got out. You know, I'm a free man. Right. I'm open to other opportunities. Yeah. But the British were like, <laughs> oh, wait, isn't there an embassy like right around the corner? Maybe we should tell uh, the U.S. guys. Uh, this happened. <laughs> so that's what they, they do, right? Yeah. They go to the attache at the U.S. Embassy, and they're like, look, we know Fred is not really the IT guy, and we need to talk to him. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The FBI, I think, is is pretty public with their legal attache and stuff. They don't need to be all skullduggery-ish about it. But, uh, but yeah, the FBI said, okay. We believe you, and thanks for telling us. Uh, we're going to open an investigation into McGonagall. And in 2021, just a few years back, U.S. attorneys conspired. They secretly got a grand jury together to look at the evidence. And the Justice Department had to admit that a grand jury was happening, but they refused to say what the grand jury was investigating or whether it remained ongoing, which is a brilliant psych. I mean, they have to, but it's also brilliant from a, 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 a psyop standpoint, because if you have done anything yeah. that you're worried about and you just hear there's a grand jury doing something, you know what I mean? Just it's make, that, make that announcement and watch everybody. So. Right, right. <laughs> open open your safe of uh, fake passports and, and get your bag of loose diamonds out. I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Or your, like, coffee can if you're a uh, 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 better cold saw. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Or whatever it is. It's like, a you know, one of those cookie tins mm -hmm. that everyone keeps, like, sewing stuff in. You know, I saw one of those with cookies in it one time, and it yeah. blew my mind. Those are good cookies, man. Those shortbread cookies. Yeah, pretty you good. You like those? I like them. I like them all right. I mean, I don't, I'm not a very You're sweet not a person. Guy. Yeah. Nah. Pretty sure those cookies had PCP in them. Cool. You don't put them in there unless they got some, unless they're wet. They come in there. <laughs> <laughs> wet cookies? They come, they come in their own little tiny dainty little little cup, you know? <laughs> like yeah. A little coffee, coffee paper filter. cup. <laughs> That's so the PCP hey, doesn't leak out. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So, Let's do a ride along. <laughs> <laughs> King Kong ain't got nothing on Matt. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, Matt's childhood PCP experiences aside. <laughs> the, uh, this is why you are the way you are. Which That's is awesome. It. Yeah. Uh, which is awesome. Uh, this is not us condoning smoking wet, but uh, let us know about your experiences. Uh, <laughs> we should cut all of that out, you guys. No, I'm so no, sorry. no, it's funny. Let's keep it. Let's keep it. Um, and let's keep out the. Let's keep in the part where we say let's keep it. So, uh, okay. So here's how we know about this earlier. Business Insider, which has done a series of great reports on this, they managed to obtain a witness subpoena that shed light on what they were doing. And at the time, the subpoena was asking this witness for records about McGonagall's interaction with a consulting firm, and consulting firms can be very shady, uh, called Spectrum Risk Solutions. Yeah, the more innocuous the name, the more shady the dealings. And it's, yeah. we should say it's security. Like, it's, it's based in security. So, right? Right. You, you have a former FBI agent who has a lot of uh, security experience who's now moving into the private sector. And then that thing, like, what is that entity doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because security, like consulting, can also mean many, many different things. Uh, but on the if we didn't look past the surface, it makes sense. If you're a private firm, you want to hire somebody with experience, right? And they have experience in one of the best intelligence counterintelligence operations on the planet. So this is this is a good get for you. But it turns out that Spectrum was probably doing some shady proxy stuff to help with some introductions that we don't have to get into, but we do know they involved operatives of uh, a guy we're about to meet 
Oleg Deripaska. Not not my pal Oleg. Different dude. Much older. Much older than my my pal. But uh, not to be confused with Olaf, the delightful singing snowman from the Frozen film franchise. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely not. That guy. That guy is Pakistan intelligence through and through. Everybody knows he's with ISI. But uh, I'm saying rewatch it. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> It's there. It's, All the it's, clues are there. It's there if you look for it. Uh, so, Magana, let's talk about the charges. All right, what's he actually charged with? And again, he hasn't been convicted. So McGonagall was actually charged in two separate corruption cases uh, involving illegal cash receipts and money laundering. Uh, the first for allegedly taking secret payments of more than $225,000 from a former Albanian intelligence agent on behalf of a political party there. Um, he also apparently kept a framed photo of him. <laughs> With Albanian Prime Minister Edi Rama. I'm I'm laughing because it's just that's a weird thing to do in general. You know, you gotta really stand for somebody if you're walking around with a framed photo of you and them, like that's not a member of your family. It's sort of like those people that have pictures of them and like George Bush on their mantle. But this is even a step further than that, isn't it? Right. Yeah, I want to put this part in because it's <laughs> It, it seems to indicate that he was, like you said, proud of the relationship and also wasn't wasn't worried about people knowing that. Uh, this is his home office, by the way, in the same room. He's got a framed photo of him with a guy named Ramush Heradinaj, who was a uh, former prime minister of Kosovo. This starts to get international real quick. Uh, we also know in 2018 he had access to a secret list of. Russian oligarchs that Uncle Sam was going to sanction for their ties to the Kremlin, their ties to Putin. When he was keeping an eye, like the, the mm -hmm. his group was keeping an eye specifically on those oligarchs. Where's their right. money? Where how, how is it being spent right now and moved around? And then he ends up being accused of uh, trying to get this one particular oligarch. Tarapaska removed from that uh, potential list, right? Right. The mongoose appears to have befriended the snake it was supposed to hunt. The That second charge is just as you described it, Matt. There's this Russian oligarch, Oleg Tarapaska, and uh, apparently McGonagall and he worked out some kind of arrangement where he was going to try to get Tarapaska off of U.S. sanctions, which is a big, big deal because – he has access to a lot of money from his side of the fence. And if he can play ball in the U S uh, then he can move that money very easily to make it dance for him in all kinds of ways. Dance for me money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So he was paid monthly, right? He, he was like uh, employed on a payroll. Yeah. <laughs> he had W nines, you know, I mean, this is, well, I don't know. About no, that. I know he definitely <laughs> did not have anything of the sort. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, he was he was paid twenty five thousand dollars a month for work that he was doing here, which is great money. Twenty five thousand dollars that that should give everybody kind of a glimpse into what oligarch well, like the the capital the oligarchs are capable of spending easily. You know, no, it's not House of Saud level, but it's still it's big. You know, this this is the kind of thing where in the mind of the oligarch, you go, what's the smallest amount of money that would seem like a huge money to one of these law peasants? <laughs> yeah, about 25 G's a month. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but what account is it going to come from? Ah, that's where you get careful, right? Because in addition to that 25 grand you're ponying up, you also have to pay for the uh, support structure. To keep it from looking like you're openly cutting this guy a check every month. So this goes through an account held by a former Russian diplomat who worked as an interpreter for the U.S. government. His name, Sergei Shestakov. Not made up. That's his real name. And one would assume that, you know, these types of folks are vetted pretty heavily if they're former Russian officials or, or Russian op, you know, would you consider a diplomat, not an operative, but still people within the Russian government, if they're coming to work for us, you would assume that they're, they're being paid pretty close attention to in terms of their background and their allegiances and all of that. Right. 
Yeah, yeah. The the bar is pretty high. The background checks are quite extensive. You know, the net is pretty tight there. Um, and because they're professional, these folks are professionals, right? They're they're not amateurs. And the, the one of the big issues that's happened in recent years is that the U.S. government has challenges getting people who are fluent in certain high value languages. Like it's it, it's tough to find those people, so they are prioritized. That's right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let, let's talk about. There is Pasca. Uh, he has, he and McGonagall, this is very cinematic. They have been aware of each other for years. Like the, the FBI, as far back as 2014, tried to recruit our pal Oleg as an informant. Because, of course, he's high value. Well, yeah, let's, let's talk about why he's high value. Yeah. Okay. Sure. This dude, oh, this oligarch, Oleg, was the richest person in Russia. In 2008, the richest person in Russia in 2008. Whoa. And then what happened in 2008, 2009, guys? Huge crash in the United States, huge global economy crash. He ended up losing a ton of money, had a bunch of debt. Uh, and his his net worth right now is around just under three billion. But he was the richest person in Russia in 2008. And you can imagine then after losing a ton of that money, by the time you get to 2014, he's made all the connections as the richest, the former richest person in Russia. Right. And he's moving in. Now I shall exploit them. (laughs) Yeah, he's in a he's pretty he's in a much more vulnerable place than he had been in a long time. Probably you can imagine he was a target. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, see, I was reading it the other way. I was looking at it like he lost all that money. He had all these connections from back when he was super rich. So now he was going to exploit those connections. But it's the other way around to what we were saying earlier. That access that he had was was seen as like red meat for those who would seek to exploit him. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. The FBI wanted him, right? Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The FBI. Of course you would want this, this guy's the bell of the ball, intelligence-wise. You know what I mean? It's like that Uncle Sam poster. We want you, except it's a dude in a suit with some glasses. And it just I, I'm sorry to just keep harping on this, guys, but he's involved in so many industries within oh, yeah. Russia that if you think about the actions Russia took with the Crimean Peninsula, you know, for shipping, for getting uh, goods in and out of Russia and out of that that whole area, basically, he was in... Uh, what, how do they describe it at Forbes? Uh, aluminum, like utilities, energy, construction, agriculture. He was in all the stuff. <laughs> all like the things. Agroculture, am I right? There we go. Also, two important points. I, I'm hesitant sometimes with the use of oligarchs to describe the these Russian uh, actors. They are tentacles of the state, but also it seems to imply that there aren't oligarchs running the United States, and that's very that's right. much the case. Yeah, I, mean, I always I always get a little confused about the term. I mean, officially, uh, it is a, a small group of, of, of very wealthy individuals that kind of run a state in a sort of shadowy way, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because because they've got the power of the purse essentially, like their their money talks, and they are influencing government. But no, what what is what what are corporations? You know, in in America, you know, what are like super super wealthy campaign donors? Why are so many people? Uh, why are so many of the same people on the top board of directors across all these companies? And that revolving door you were talking about, Ben. You know, folks going from you know these positions of government power to private industry, and then becoming the top dogs there and then they have those connections i mean this is a topic for another day but i agree i think the term oligarch especially in terms of using to, to describe other countries it's like this is something that happens in other countries so <laughs> but yeah that's, that's so the, not true <laughs> yeah that's the point i'm making here's the second point or just real quick so i can sew this up uh he is oleg is in trouble in russia as well now this uh last year a year ago actually he called for peace in Ukraine. He said destroying Ukraine would be a huge mistake. And a few months after that, uh, Russian authorities started seizing some of his assets, including a uh, hotel complex he owns in Sochi. Oh, that, that's right. That was, a, that was a retribution kind of almost, wasn't it? Well, again, we got, I think we, when we do a series on oligarchs, it's probably this guy's his own episode. But 
But yes. we do. We just. I, I think the only reason why I, I'm okay with describing Oleg as an oligarch is because he is one of these guys that got his his business roots are at the collapse of the Soviet Union. Right, so he's one of the these privatization. guys. He's one of the guys that swooped in with private money, bought up all of the state-run stuff that well, the, was state-run at the time, and then just made billions and billions for the, of dollars. For the equivalent of pennies on the dollar, yeah. And McGonagall had investigated multiple Russian operatives earlier in his career. It's currently unclear whether he was involved with the effort to recruit Deripaska. But here's the thing. If you've ever worked anywhere, you tend to have some idea of your colleague's projects. Unless you're in like the puzzle palace, you are, you might not be actively involved in something, but you know what they do, right? You're not up to the day-to-day of, of the accounting or, or like the folks who are, I don't know, involved in some new initiative, but you know they're doing something. You roughly know what. Uh, before his retirement in 2018, McGonagall had moved to the point where he was directly in charge of investigating Oleg. And this guy, like you said, man, he already been implicated in so many criminal acts over the years, including Russian attempts to to sway the U.S. election, the same election that, according to some anonymous sources, McGonagall may have also tried to sway. The press caught on. They began reporting on this and they uncovered a lot of firsthand accounts from anonymous former colleagues. But then also they found account messy personal life stuff. Like it looked like Oleg and Charlie had started helping each other out kind of on a, on a personal as well as professional level. Like he was, Charlie was helping Oleg's daughter with some stuff. Uh, it was very important to Oleg that she get to the U S to give birth so that her child would have U S papers that were clean. Um, and it seems like Charlie was also stepping out, on, on his wife, who he described as his ex-wife. They seem to have been estranged for a bit. And this is just reporting. This is not us personally saying this. Uh, so he had an extramarital relationship, a girlfriend on the side, Allison Guerrero, uh, from about spring of 2017 to 2018. Yes, yes, uh, relationships can always be tough. Affairs are not ethically sound. But adultery is not a crime in Maryland. Still, this tells us more about the case. What do we mean? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsors. And we've returned. You know, Matt, it occurs to me that this next part of the story, if someone makes a movie on this, this is going to be the part they focus on way too much because screenwriters and TV writers are always like, oh, let's. Let's talk about the emotional aspects of the thing. Let's have everybody use their names way too often in a scene. Well, yeah, the B storyline is it it's often what gets you through to the next important plot point. Yeah. I mean, it's functional. You're, you're right. I I I I sound cold. I'm sorry. I think it's okay for people to have emotions. That's not fair of me. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> So, uh, okay, these guys both have pretty, they don't have perfect personal lives. Who does? The thing is, it would not have necessarily been illegal for Charlie McGonagall to work for Oleg Deripaska, right? No, I mean, if it was, if he truly left his post at the FBI and just started up, you know, a new position somewhere, utilizing the things he'd learned in his position, not necessarily any of the secrets, but the skills then I guess that's okay. We do know you don't, you never really leave an intelligence agency when you retire. And not really, kind of, mostly, but not really. I mean, yeah, I guess it depends on, because these are big, big operations, right? So I guess it depends on what you do. But if you're like a special agent in charge, it does seem like those relationships and influences would follow you after, you know, after you leave, um, and even if even people who go through the debriefing process still, I, I'm confident they can still make some calls and things like that. I don't think it's, um, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know if we want to 
paint a huge broad brush and say that everybody is still active when they leave. Some yeah, people, yeah, yeah. I would never some people say are that. still, some people are still just, you know, going fishing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, I don't and, mean to say, I don't mean to say you're always active even when you retire. What I mean is like a part of it, a part of the journey stays with you. You know what I mean? I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, but ultimately there's a, you have a tie to the FBI now, no matter what, even if you're retired, right? And it's known right. that you have that information. You know, it's no, it's known that you're aware of the methods. That's probably one of the most important things. Yeah, so, agreed. If you're gonna go into a relationship like this with an oligarch, you basically would just have to inform everybody and be upfront about it. Hey, guys, just want to let you know, I'm doing my thing over here now with Oleg. Uh, you know, you check it out if you need to. It's Totally fine. Buff board. But uh, that's not what happened. Do you think they had nicknames for each other? Oh, was yeah. He, was, was he calling him like uh, the leg man or something? That's a cool dick name. Sure. Yeah, it's the leg man. It was probably just like Chuck and Greg or something real simple. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. They might. They may not have. Their conversations may not have been as fun as ours. But, uh, but yeah, the Foreign Agents Registration Act. It's an old law, and it's one of those laws that is still in effect. Uh, it requires anybody who is operating for a foreign government organization or just a, a VIP of some sort to disclose their relationship to the Department of Justice. And, and part of this, I mean, it doesn't ban any specific activities, but it's kind of like a let us know, loop us in. So we understand what's going on. And if you don't do that, then you can get hit with a $250,000 fine and up to five years in prison. Uh, there's, there's a report, again, from Business Insider, did some excellent work here, that shows McGonagall's girlfriend kind of always knew something was up. She knew, like, he was lying to her about the state of his previous relationship. You know, he said he loved his kids, but... He has a soon-to-be ex-wife, and they're definitely going to get divorced. And they've been, per her, uh, they've, he's saying that, you know, it, the marriage is over, and it's just almost a matter of paperwork. And he goes back home to Maryland once or twice a month, but he has a an apartment in Park Slope in New York. And uh, one day in October 2017, I think it is, she's hanging out at his apartment, and she sees a literal bag of cash on the floor bundles and bundles of big denominations wrapped up in rubber bands and she's like charlie what what's going on and he says oh i want to bet on a, on a baseball game dang charlie <laughs> i know okay. man wow duffel bag bets all right <laughs> yeah should do that more often Jeez, louise uh yeah yeah um i guess the girlfriend his his a uh, girlfriend at the time really just kind of believed what what she was being sold um and he was definitely not being upfront about really anything there um and i don't know i don't i guess you just kind of move on and go all right well i guess that's his that's his baseball money let's <laughs> go see that movie charlie's baseball money yeah uh she had also had relationships in the past with people who are in law enforcement. You can find a picture of her with uh, Giuliani, by the way, Rudy Giuliani. And yeah, and she said, you know, sometimes I just didn't ask questions. I knew Charlie lived large. He would take her to really posh, nice restaurants. He would give her gifts of large amounts of cash for her birthday, like $500,000, uh, he said he would frame his divorce papers for her as a present. He would take her to private box games uh, to watch the New Jersey Devils. It's a hockey team there. And then she saw, she recalls stuff like one time he just gave somebody on the street $100, like a guy's wow. panhandling. And he said, well, I'm better off than he is. I'm going to try to help him because I'm in a better place. And then she also said she contracted cancer. She battled cancer for a while. And she said during that time, he would um, he was very loving and caring, and he would send agents to drive her back and forth from treatment in government vehicles. 
he's kind of playing fast and loose with the company uh, property at that yeah, point. Yeah, that's pretty nuts. Um, so McGonagall and his girlfriend were living it up. They were doing some great things. I mean, come on. Hanging out, watching the New Jersey Devils in a box. That's cool. That's fun. Uh, but his girlfriend said, quote, he needed to make more money. He had two kids to put through college. And, he, you know, he, it was a whole other family as a wife, too. Uh, he needed to make more money. It's the big deal here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's never enough, right? We all know mm-hmm. the game. Uh, and, You're living in the work world. slope, for God's sakes, in an apartment. Come on. That's an expensive <laughs> area. And that's your second place or third. That's or your second place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the world of counterintelligence, you know, any, any little crack in someone's personal life can, should, and will be used as leverage if needed. So that means, <laughs> Matt threw up the devil hordes there. Uh, that means that any compromising personal information uh, can and will be used against someone. And infidelity is just as valuable to those sorts of operatives as crushing debt. It's a way in. But it doesn't seem, in this case, that adultery was the prime factor in his turning. It seems he sold himself for different reasons. And, again, if there is a conviction that follows, if Uncle Sam is able to prove this conspiracy, it honestly looks like he sold himself kind of cheap. Because... When he was private industry, sources report he was pulling something like three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, not counting annual bonuses. And I get it; college costs are increasing, but that's still that's a fair amount of money, I would imagine. It's a lot of money. You kidding me? It's, that's it's a, a lot, lot of money. money. It's quite a bit of money. And so, before we start sounding like a Seinfeld episode or curb your enthusiasm, it's a lot of money. Uh, he apparently needed more. And remember, I think earlier, Matt, you mentioned it was $225,000 that he had received in the high level world of tradecraft and consulting firms and oligarchs. That's Peanuts. I mean, if you do the cost benefit analysis, well, we say even just the Foreign Registration Act getting popped on that one is a two hundred fifty thousand dollar fine. You know, take a lesson from the banks. Make sure that if you are convicted of a crime, the fine for that is less than the money you made doing the crime. Hey, so you always come out on top. So you always <laughs> come out on top. <laughs> and uh, shout out Mac, always sunny Philadelphia. I mean. That's the thing. All right. The current status, Charles McGonagall has not been convicted. Uh, There has not been a trial. So a lot of what we're exploring here is just what has been said in the public sphere. Uh, It's quite possible that there is information on the defense side and the prosecutor side that will only later come to light. And it may change the conversation. Uh, He made bail. He paid a $500,000 bond. Uh, He is, uh, to all accounts, he is currently residing there in Maryland. Uh, In in, in Chevy Chase, not in in Park Slope, New York, or whatever. Is that that, uh, Brooklyn? I think that is Brooklyn. Yeah, 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 it's Brooklyn. Uh, And I got to ask, do you think he'll be convicted? Um, Oh, I don't know. I think on some charges, at least. There's fishy stuff, but... It's high. It's also so highly sensitive. I wonder how much. Oh, right. How, how much could be an open it, court? Yeah. Ah, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I I personally think right now it is likely that he'll be convicted on at least some charges. But this is only a chapter in a much larger story of conspiracy. As we're recording today, it is certain that multiple government agents are being targeted by turn for turning operations. Hopefully, none of them will be successful. The McGonagall case is extraordinarily rare, but the conspiracies continue. We only know about the ones who get caught. Of course, foreign powers want people on the inside of their rivals' operations, and why not? I mean, don't forget, folks, especially if you live in America, around the planet, in every country you can imagine, right now, the United States wants the same. It's how the game is played. So, um, happy. But you know, let's do our little podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, let's talk about it. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, 
So what do you think? Is this, this just a case of a former spy going out and trying to make some cash in, you know, a way that he understands how to do it? Or is it some kind of tricksy thing going on in the back in the background between the U.S. and Russian powers? Uh, I, I don't know if uh, we saw this, Ben, but there was a March 2017 report connecting this same guy, Deripaska, Oleg, to Paul Manafort, the guy who was running Trump's campaign. And allegedly, Paul Manafort was getting paid a lot of money uh, on a multi-year contract to specifically promote uh, Russia and uh, the things that Russia wanted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He had a contract with Deripaska. Uh, Deripaska also sued Manafort. He did. <laughs> He did. (laughs) There's a connection to Christopher Steele from the Steele dossier, you Mm -hmm. know, the PP dossier. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's some weird stuff going on with that oligarch. That guy who, the guy who is known as an oligarch. (laughs) Yeah. Which, which oligarchs uh, should we look into? Let us know. Uh, We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Again, this is an unfolding case, but it's, it's a window through which we can view a world that doesn't often get explored. We want to hear your thoughts. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, until the U.S. takes that down. Uh, We'd love it if you check out our YouTube show. Uh, You can see, not too many spoilers, but you can see um, Matt and I getting back to our roots there in in a way that I think we both really enjoy. And And also, not uh, like our roots, dancing way too much. (laughs) And... um, (laughs) And if you don't sip the social meads, as always, we've got your back. Fellow conspiracy realists, you can call us directly. Dial 1833-STDWYTK. It's a voicemail system. Give yourself a cool nickname. We don't care what it is. Don't use your real name. Come on. We've learned more than this. Don't use your real name. Say whatever you'd like. At some point, tell us if we can use your name and message on the air. If you've got more to say than can fit in that three minutes, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.